I recently bumped into a young lady who I've known for many years, and I noticed on her left hand, she had a ring. And I said to her, well, what is that? And she said, that's a promise ring. And I said, well, what are you promising? And when she looked at me as if I had two heads, she said, well, I'm promised to be committed to my boyfriend. And I said, well, that's meaningless. And of course, she got irritated with me. But I said, you're already divorced. Of course, knowing me to be the bold person that I am, I said, you made a vow to your husband and you broke that. So the conversation went on for a little bit before we realized it wasn't going anywhere. But I did say to her, because I was close enough to say, your words mean nothing. If you can make a vow in front of God and then go ahead and make a vow to another person that wasn't even in front of God, what does it mean? We proceeded to get into this conversation about people. This generation has no value for vows and words and words mean nothing. And of course, every generation thinks the generation after them is worse. So that's not what I'm talking about, though it is worse and worse. So I went to the Bible because I used to teach financial classes and I used this particular proverb, although at this point I'm going to Ecclesiastes. And the Bible very much so sp speaks on this. And so in Ecclesiastes chapter 5, it says, num uh, verse 1, Be not hasty in your utterance, and let not your heart be quick to utter a promise in God's presence. God is in heaven, and you are on earth, therefore let your words be few. And so it goes on to say, I'll skip 2 and 3, or uh, skip verse 2, and it says, Oh, actually, I won't skip two. Two says, as dreams come along with many cares, so fool's voice along with a multitude of words. But specifically referring to the vow in verse three, Ecclesiastes says, when you make a vow to God, delay not its fulfillment. For God has no pleasure in a fool's words, has no pleasure in fools. Fulfill what you have vowed. Verse four makes it even stronger. It is better not to make a vow than to make a vow and not fulfill it. So it goes on and it talks specifically about vows in this chapter. When I taught financial classes, I remember teaching people about this, you'll, how you spend your money. Also, you will have to answer to God for it. The idea of bankruptcy and debt and credit is all a vow. Let me explain. When you get a credit card, when you charge something, when you get a loan, you're giving me this money for my car, and then I am promising you that I will pay it. So then when you go bankrupt, or you go to collections, or you make a decision to just stop paying it for whatever reason, I get that some people just, I, I can't, I don't have it, but out of many, out of poor spending or overspending, well, I'm just going to keep living on credit. You're going to have to answer to God for that because you made a vow to pay and you didn't repay. So it's easy to look at it in the financial perspective. When I apply this to the marital perspective or the words that we promise someone, I vow to you, if you do this, I will do that. God, if you rescue me from this, I'll be a nun. Our vows matter to God. So if you don't think you can fulfill a vow, do not make it. But specifically with marriage, we make vows. I promise to love, honor, and cherish you. Death to his part, sickness and in health, good times and bad, rich or poor, all the days of my life. And I've said this time and time again, richer or poor means when you go bankrupt, you don't divorce because you've got a spouse with a gambling habit or they just can't keep money in the account or they've hidden money or they've done shady things. That's the worst. All the things that I've talked about before, pornography, uh, infidelity, uh, what are the ugly things we have to deal with. Deceit. I've dealt with people who have had to deal with some horrifying things. 
but you made a vow that you're married to that person till the day you die. Lord, I promise I honor, love, honor, and cherish this person. For some, it was love, honor, and obey. As God told us, it should be for women should obey their husbands. Often, they don't even do that vow anymore because most women are like, I ain't going to obey you. I know I would have been one of those. Although now I understand the idea of obeying the head of my family, which is my husband. But I'm not going to get into that conversation right now. Let's save that for another video because we'll get too sidetracked. But when I made a vow, I made a vow. Many of you may not know that I married my husband in 1983 and then I left him in 1986 uh, for another man. Had an affair. Was apart from him two years. Well, was with the other man for two years. Was apart from my husband for four years. And it was in that four-year time that my husband started pursuing me again. We started talking and I was scared to death because he kept saying, do you want to reconcile? Please, let's reconcile. And I remember standing there. Again, I didn't take seriously all of this yet, although the Lord obviously was planted in there and working in me. Somehow I knew the truth of what I'm talking about now because I remember thinking to myself, well, Christine, when you first got married, you're 18, pregnant, and stupid. Everyone would understand you getting out of this marriage. But if you get back together with him now, you're eight years older. You've been in marriage. You've had problems. You, you get back together. Marriage is for life. And I wasn't even focusing on this vow here. I wasn't focusing on the Bible verse. But God had a grip on my heart. And he would be using that years and decades later like he is today. Because something in me knew I was making a promise. And no matter how hard things got, and they got hard. There were several times in those decades that I wanted to still leave. But I knew that I had made a vow. Part of it was my fighting spirit, like, dang it, I'm not giving up. But it's a sin. It is a sin to make a vow and not repay. Your marriage is a vow. Further, it's a covenant between you, God, and your spouse. So even if your spouse leaves, you still have a vow with God. So your spouse is off philandering, cheating on you, doing what they want. I'm not telling you you have control over what they do, but that doesn't unmarry you. Your spouse is sleeping with 45 different women. I'm sad to say it doesn't unmarry you. You can still love him. What does love look like? Does that mean you always have to stay in the same household? No. But loving someone... Love is patient. Love is kind. Love does not keep record of wrongs. Love is not rude. We want to be rude to a spouse that's cheating on us. We want to be unkind. We want to slap them in the face and spit on them. We want to beat them to a pole. We want to scream in their face. But you made a vow to love them, no matter what happened. Your spouse is in an accident. They're now a vegetable. I think of a very famous case, uh, Terry Schiavo, when she was a vegetable in a car accident, and her husband ultimately decided to not feed her. It was a very public case. I'm not going to feed her or give her a drink. Just let her die. Now that's between him and God, but he had a vow to keep. We don't know what is going to come our way. But I am telling you that God takes very seriously vows. It is better to vow and not repay. It is better not to vow than to vow and not repay. Give God what you promised. He'll reward you for being a man or a woman of your word. I'm Dr. Christine Bacon. Thanks for watching this informational bacon bit. And as always, live your life. Sunny side up.